Good evening and good night everyone. This is update for May 23, 2022, day 89 of the war, end of the date update. So today we're going to look at a few general questions and then we're going to do walkthrough as we always do. So we're going to just, uh, I will just explain a little bit more about the units so the new viewers able to better follow and understand what's happening. So how do you read this unit names? First of all, if there is nothing, just a number, it means it's a brigade, right? In Russian cases, it's, it's a mechanized brigade. But for all intents and purposes, it's more or less the same. And what this means in terms of number of troops, think about it. It's very simplified, obviously, right? We're not trying to make it perfectly precise. It's very simple. It's about, think about 4,000 uh, soldier or so 4,000 troops because actually if you really think uh, the way it works in sort of call it Soviet army because both of them are representative of Soviet army let's say if there is like 4,000 uh, unit only half of it is actual battle like troops that participate in the fight right so <clears throat> if you have 4,000 only 2,000 are really who's going to fight the rest is just all kind of sort of administrative not administrative but like logistical medical all kind of like communication all, all kind of support functions that you can imagine there so okay so if it's just number it means uh, brigade right if it if there is a letter t it means tank so for in this case it's uh, tank brigade and then in russian case it's a tank and then d means stands for division right so it's a, a tank division so uh, M stands for mechanized division, right? So just uh, larger uh, than brigade and division. Usually you can kind of think it's uh, 10,000 people. It's not perfect, but you just can simplify it. It's simplifying assumption, let's put it this way. In case of airborne, this is uh, air, A stands for air and then D airborne division. It's less, they usually like less than 9,000 like 8.5 so you can say 8.5 9 whatever is easier for your brain to kind of keep in mind and then here a b it means 11th airborne brigade and airborne brigades are uh, smaller so they about 3,000 people just for simple for simplest purposes right and the same goes true for nb which stands for naval infantry brigade the same kind of stuff about you can just for your simple for simplicity just assume it's 3,000 uh, people then we have, uh, let's say in this case, 14 SFB. SFB means uh, Special Forces Brigade. That's, you can just assume it's 1,000, could be 1.5, could be up to 1.7, could be less, could be like 500. So just assume it's one, 1,000 um, uh, people there. Uh, RGT means, uh, um, sorry, we lost our, um, RGT means regiment, right? So. Uh, it's a um, sort of regiment is a, is a component of the division, right? So divisions can can, uh, consist of regiments and then regiment consists of battalions. So <clears throat> this is how their uh, divisional structure is done. So there are two kind of approaches. One is where the basic, um, basic block is a brigade, which is how Ukrainian army is built. It, the basic block is brigade. Ukrainian army does not have divisions. So it's all smaller units on the relative, like size-wise, right? Organizationally, it's smaller unit. Russian army used to be built uh, around divisions from the in the Soviet Union time and Ukraine uh, the same way, I guess. So uh, then they switched to brigade level because there was not enough um, uh, troops and battle-ready troops specifically. So they switched to... Uh, brigade level and then starting from about like 2012 2013 they started going back to the divisional level but they did not finish sort of transition before this war started so they kind of like in a hybrid situation when some of them are divisions some of them are brigades so that's just kind of hopefully this helps to understand this whole logic here and then we have um, peculiar things for the russia is like here, 7 MC. MC means, means uh, military camp. This is occupational force uh, of the Russian army in different, um, in other countries. So, for example, I believe it's uh, 7 M uh, MC is, and 4 MC, they are occupational forces in Georgia. This is a country 
in uh, in Caucasus. So basically, it's bordering uh, Russia. It's next to Armenia, next to Turkey, um, next to Azerbaijan. Hopefully, that helps you to get a feeling about ge ge geography of that. And this, they can actually these military camps are kind of vary depending on their job, the importance, and so on. So in this case, 7MC and 4MC, that really uh, means uh, brigade level units. But for example, Russia has uh, 201st uh, military camp, which is in uh, Central Asia, believe in Tajikistan. So that's a divisional level unit. So that's kind of could be misleading because it's everything is called military camp but you know the, the military camps could be different right so so this hopefully helps to better understand and follow what's going on for a new uh, viewers oh and there is another unit that's um that's part of the ukraine the peculiarity for ukraine are uh, militia brigades and militia brigades in ukraine about uh, three thousand people they literally have no artillery no any um, no tanks, no any armored infantry we, uh, we, vehicles, no nothing. Just uh, literally, they have trucks and they have soldiers with machine guns, with rifles, with anti-tank uh, rockets and anti-air rockets, and that's pretty much it. So it's extremely uh, light, lightly um, um, armed units, right? So they have a very limited ability uh, to withstand to the uh, to the attacks of units that have artillery, that have mortars, they, that have air support and so on, and have tanks and, and, and all of that. So they really low on, on firepower, basically. So that needs to be understood. And those units in Ukraine, usually about 100, right? So if it's, you know, anything about 100, uh, and I think it starts at 100 exactly, uh, that really means that that's... Uh, uh, the um, militia brigade so hopefully that helps to understand this whole logic and we're still planning to make uh, separate videos to discuss a little bit of this whole thing in more in depth and detail in more precision but just for today hopefully this this is going to be sufficient to kind of get by let's put this way uh, then uh, there was um, always never ending question what's going on with 700,000 Ukrainian uh, recruits, where, what are they doing, what's going on? So, again, answering that question, very simple. Ukraine does not have enough weapons. We can, I'm just going to repeat it probably hundreds of times, but Ukraine does not have enough weapons to arm all of these people. And in a way, it's not even clear to us why to mobilize so many people. But whatever, the, the whatever is being done is being done. Um, and... So Ukrainian army is is about two hundred thousand people, right? That's what it had before the war. We estimate that Ukraine lost probably about like seventeen thousand uh, dead and uh, and three times more um, wounded. So all kind of losses in our estimate roughly uh, is uh, about plus minus sixty thousand. Actually, probably more if it's probably more like towards uh, pushing 70, 65 to 67. This is very estimated. This is estimate. This is not like based on any kind of sort of scientific approach. This is basically extrapolating small samples that we have seen on the larger population, right? So it could be, could be mistakes in the process. But because neither side discloses uh, actual numbers of uh, dead and wounded, there's... You know, we, we want to use at least some kind of ballpark number to help to understand what's happening, right, from a big picture perspective. So this is about Ukrainian army. So what it lost probably pushing 70,000, so 200 minus 70, 130. But it was refilled with all of these new conscripts, right? So it's back to close to 200. It's down on equipment, so it has fewer equipment that it used to have at the beginning of the war. Because there were quite a bit of losses, and especially where there there is fewer equipment is uh, tanks. So Ukrainian army definitely has fewer tanks at this point than it used to have before the war started. So uh, that's kind of major item there. Obviously, a lot fewer aircraft. Um, even though we don't really follow that, but you you know Ukrainian uh, air force essentially is 
is uh, is almost we want to say non-existent but that's not true uh, they still do they still exist but it's totally totally small amount uh, especially if you compare it to the russian um, air forces so now let's look at actually a russian sort of estimate of their losses and where they are stand so they also started with 200 when they invaded ukraine they in our estimate uh, losses are uh, small like like fewer so about like up to 15 pushing 15,000 could be 14 could be 14.5 15 somewhere in that ballpark and then the total losses so like including wounded and all that is about 60,000 so so that really means that they uh, have 140 from the original number but what they also able is to replenish is through the contract soldiers right so there are like volunteers uh, in Russia who signed the contract and they go fight as a soldier. So our very rough estimate that they got about 25,000 of those. So that gives us about 165,000 uh, of Russian soldier, soldiers here on the battlefield, right? So that's just to understand what's going on here. Um, so that's a big picture so as you can see the russian army is actually a little bit smaller than ukrainian one but the problem uh, with ukrainian as we said that it's very poor on equipment so that what prevents ukrainian army from taking you know realizing that uh, numerical human uh, uh, advantage relative to the russian plus there is a lot of organizational and training problems on the ukrainian side so that also sets back uh, ability to use that advantage and that's for that reason uh, ukraine uh, in the current shape and form if there is no changes in ukraine army it needs a lot more uh, foreign weapons to be able to successfully continue fighting than otherwise would have been needed because there is you know less training uh like more um, like lower quality uh command and to say to, to be fair russian side suffers equally the same in terms of low quality of command so there is the both we said it many times that both army are kind of twins in that way there is uh they both um they both suffer at mid at high level of the command and terribly so Okay, so hopefully this helps to understand kind of like a big picture in terms of like numbers, equipment, where everybody is standing. Now let's actually go and uh, look at what's going on uh, at the front lines. We're going to do as always in clockwise fashion and we're going to start from the very north, from Chernihiv region and then we're going to go down south. So this whole section that used to be quiet or was said before about uh, three weeks ago was relatively quiet now it's uh, artillery ping pong in different locations so they just uh, sometimes here there but basically about a couple of days ago we observed that intensity slightly went up and it, it stays at, the, at that level at the uh, heightened level it didn't go up further more but there is clear ping pong going on here and this ping pong in our opinion is is for the russia to keep the door open to declare formal war on ukraine if they decide to go past of mobilization inside of the country in in our scenario is that they will be forced to do that unless they use uh, sort of uh, other weapons such as uh, nuclear weapons or there is decision to have a peace somehow we don't believe in those like we believe that those scenarios are extremely low probability so um in our opinion it's um most probable scenario that there is a mobilization in russia and then it, there is another turn of this war so now let's actually look at what's going on northeast of kharkiv front line here is more or less stable there is the, the essence of the fight is Ukrainian side wants to completely destroy this Russian buffer here on Ukrainian territory and Russian side wants to prevent Ukrainian side from destroying that buffer so the it's low intensity fighting it's like, uh, at the level of like company at most you know squads and like they just it's nothing terribly intense here there is uh, ongoing fighting for this, for this village Ternova um, there, there are we hear some of the uh, sort of rumors that Ra Russian troops try to uh, 
like kind of like launch tiny kind of offensive here not really like meaning like a, a company size at most it, it's it's really not uh, nothing major basically it's uh, the this units here we don't even know if they are still there what we're seeing here it's mostly as the infantry uh, is a second and third rated troops from DNR and LNR those are um, uh, Ukrainian occupied territories that the Russian side um, where basically they created puppet uh, governments there and uh, basically uh, mobilize forcefully some forcibly mobilizing people or just just volunteer contractors who go and fight for Russian side basically so that's kind of essence of what's going on here and the backbone here is obviously Russian artillery which helps this low quality troops to hold the line essentially that's how it kind of essentially the balance of power here now let's go south let's go let's look at what's going on at uh, Izum bridgehead and Leman bridgehead because there were some um, some events there today so this is schematic picture of the uh, Leman bridgehead here and this is all Russian units here this is Ukrainian and this point workhorse here are these four mechanized brigades because these units are above and that's why we put them in a gray color they're pretty exhausted and then this is the Man bridgehead which was split by russian forces into two pieces larger one centered around town Le Mans, and the smaller one centered around town Svetohirsk. now let's actually jump in and look what's going on there so the situation on the Izum bridge had is stable, no changes here, everything's kind of the same. Uh, then there's Svetohirsk bridge had as well, stable, no major sort of attacks one way or another. Uh, where there was a really big attack this morning is a Russian side attacked uh, town of Leman. Uh, here, as you can see, they started attack from the kind of like this northeast. Then they were joined by the forces from Mokan straight east. And they essentially first captured this like northeastern section and then they kind of spread and at this point they kind of captured most of the kind of this eastern part of the town and uh, we don't have obviously confirmation but uh, we're pretty sure that ukrainian troops left this village uh, stavki because otherwise they would be encircled there so so this uh, today was pretty strong attack then ukrainian forces were pushed and we can actually let's do a little bit zoom in and see what was where where the front line looks a little bit more precisely so as you can see here sorry for um, because um, this open street map is kind of not very good for the white color but hopefully you be, you're able to see so this is the west village drobyshova and zarichne and so they attacked along this kind of like axis here from drobyshova and then from zarichne so as a result they first captured this kind of like more northern part in ukrainian defenses are kind of going along this railroad here again as you see the railroad becomes um, it's very good um, kind of like natural defensive position for the retreating troops and we'll actually a little bit explain in the next slide why that happens that way so essentially they captured this kind of first northern northeastern portion of the town and then they kind of spread squeezing ukrainian troops here this is more like a center around here so the fighting is most of the fighting is going on here centered right now around the uh, railroad here railroad station here there are probably some smaller uh, pockets of resistance here in the center in the central part of the town but you know obviously we don't have that granularity of the data but just for like high level the the front line more or less goes along the railroad and let's actually look why a railroad makes such a great defensive position so this is um, actually kind of like a picture of well handwritten of the railroad so as you can see there is like a base base right to create a railroad and then the railroad goes on top of that base and usually this base especially in ukraine well not especially but in ukraine we don't know other places so it's made out of uh, uh, crushed granite stones so that's pretty strong very strong material actually and so um, the way the trajectory of the projectile from the artillery uh, it's actually kind of goes like this so so if you create your trench right next to the this uh, raised area it's almost impossible to hit it with artillery fire or if you do foxhole that's really the best 
So, and then, so effectively artillery becomes kind of relatively useless against this defense. The only way you can get it is through the mortar fire um, because the, the, the projectile is kind of like goes like more like this, kind of like, so, so that really means uh, the, but there is a problem. First of all, you don't have as many mortars. So you're reducing by more than a half your uh, firepower, first of all, and then mortars are, uh, they need to be very close to the front line, so they short distance um, um, sort of call it a form of fire. So uh, that's also so they vulnerable to to the fire in return. So basically, it becomes very difficult to dislodge troops who, if they are skillful and know what they do, if they hold on to this uh, railroad uh, line. Basically, hope this helps to understand why this railroad is such a uh, we, we see that quite a bit recently. So this is actually next. Uh, we would like to discuss what's going on with Ukraine power um, power grid, power uh, generation facilities more so. So the red color are um, power, gener uh, power generators that are fired by coal, coal-fired power, generator, power generation stations, probably the better way. Then uh, black one are uh, nuclear power stations and the blue one are hydro um, power stations. So as you can see where there is a finding, there's a quite a bit of concentration of the power generation resources. And for example, here near Le Mans, this, is, this, this one, uh, it's kind of middle, mid-sized, is near Le Mans. And then we're actually going to go and look at this area where there's a much bigger one here, Ligirska. Uh, power station and uh, so this all kind of gets into basically this portion if Russian side gets closer they probably will capture this one and this one so this will get out of the Ukrainian power grid and then what is already taking out of Ukrainian um, sort of power uh, grid is power supply probably better to say is this nuclear station here in Ar in Arhadar and there is a company uh, power generation station like coal fired so there's kind of like a twins in a way so that's a huge as you can see that's a huge power generation kind of complex there um, that's basically out of commission for ukraine at this point and then this is another and here's another reason why that um, russian uh, troops on the Kherson bridge had why they're trying to spread very quickly because they wanted to capture this another nuclear power station here and in, in Kriveri, there is a coal-fired power station. So as you can see, that then they're pretty big. So if they were also captured, then it's going to be, you know, an Ukrainian power system will be under extreme uh, extreme stress, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. So hopefully this gives you a little bit more perspective, even from the kind of like a power generation facility, just generally distributed. So you understand the relative importance of this, regions where the fighting is happening so now uh, let's uh, keep going uh, let's look at the Severodonetsk uh, uh, salient and let's see what's going on there so northern part is quiet there's nothing here there's no new attempts by russian side to establish bridgeheads russian troops putting pressure on ukrainian defenders uh, in Severodonetsk especially they you know they understand that uh, effectively, the logistics is super, super hard because they destroyed the bridge here across the Seversky Donetsk River. So they putting pressure, trying to, um, you know, make take advantage of the situation. Uh, then, uh, so but there are no ma any major breakthroughs or anything. The line they, they captured some some area, but it's totally nothing really major. Like sort of to say, oh, the situation has changed. Nothing changed there. So then uh, let's look at uh, a little bit more south. We're gonna go then this Toshkivka that's being where the fighting has been going on for probably weeks at this point. It's still not captured by Russian side. There's still fighting going on there. Then Russian side also uh, continues attacks frontal attacks Hirske, and then uh, they also attack Zolota today, which usually wasn't really focus of their attacks, and they kind of make some progress to kind of get stuck in the trench line essentially that's kind of how we describe so they basically didn't penetrate through the front like defensive line they get they made progress inside of it and kind of got stuck there basically 
So then uh, let's look at this uh, situation around Papasna. And so uh, now, again, no changes, no progress for the Russian side here. So situation stabilized for Ukrainian side. And as we discussed uh, before, our take on this is that because the troops are getting more spread out, the punching ability gets becomes lower. So what Russian side needs here to continue successfully, they probably need new troops. And that's a big question. Do they have those new troops? We'll find out if they continue attacking here. That means that they get new fresh troops so that they can continue attacks. But for now, based on this is like third day of no progress, that means that the situation here in balance between two sides. And obviously, we don't have full details, but as you can see, there are a lot of Ukrainian brigades here. We're pretty sure some battalions from these brigades from the 80s, 30s, 58s, 17s, that they are somewhere here as well, kind of like a patching these holes and, and, and patching these defensive lines as well so so overall uh this situation here is stable for now and then what we we mentioned before that we have we're seeing pretty distinct distinct way of fighting here which is more common sense way of fighting and you know many viewers said like okay there is nothing special yes there is nothing special for sort of normal person but for the soviet army which is both ukrainian and russian army as a so product of the soviet army that's a huge call it breakthrough right and what we're learning right now that uh, apparently this whole group of forces here is under command of the someone from this uh, Wagner group here so that's why there is a distinct change because Wagner group is not obviously regular army it's more sort of a fighting group that's based more on common sense principles uh, as opposed to uh, you know Soviet army so that's probably why they were more successful here because they you know they just use common sense strategies to to take advantage of the situation so uh, hopefully that helps and we're actually gonna look a little bit more towards south because there are changes there this is uh, actually the look at the uh, more northern uh, sort of advances of the russian troops here they stuck again and again as we mentioned the the that sort of divider the front line is the railroad tracks because they provide uh, not the tracks themselves but that whole structure provides uh, quite good defensive positions there so let's actually go south and uh, even not we, we kind of built it even more south so hopefully that let's just actually look even more south so um so this is Popasna is uh kind of like up where is that uh, here up north we didn't kind of re replicate this whole picture here around this Kamashalaha, Volodymyrka, um, but you you know it but here here's what's happening so as we discussed before uh, russian troops are basically here they were uh, what they were doing so instead of like doing frontal attacks where ukrainian troops built pretty good defensive positions and like you know uh, deep uh, lines of trenches and sometimes even bunkers so that would be quite heavy casualties so what they did they figure out that they can kind of like dislodge one one village in one position and then kind of attack it from the flank and even from the rear so that's what they did so the first they captured it was Vanivka, then they captured that way Troitske, uh several days ago and then they what they did the same was was Dvizhenka. so they attacked it kind of like from uh, from the flank and from the rear that caused the withdrawal of Ukrainian troops here and then what else happened they started advancing kind of more here south and they captured Meronivsky here and so that caused the withdrawal of this Ukrainian salient it's called Svitlodar salient and there is that huge power uh, generation facility uh, around here so that's why actually you see this lake here it's to cool down the power generators in that facility. So basically, they with this kind of like approach, they forced withdrawal of Ukrainian troops to the sort of on their call it like western side of the lake. We don't know exact. This is estimated position of Ukrainian troops here. They could be actually just simply on the western side of this lake. So without much fighting, without heavy casualties, they managed to push out Ukrainian troops basically. Uh, on the uh, base out of their positions by actually kind of creating very credible threat of encirclement and that's 
uh, again uh, intelligent way of fighting here um, unfortunately uh, for ukrainian side that's uh, not very good so uh, this this is actually new section of front line we never kind of looked at this stretch because it was always quiet but now it kind of become unquiet so uh, that's a situation here in the end it's obviously bad for ukrainian army but it's not something like okay end of the world critical okay they're just gonna withdraw to you know these positions here they are obviously less uh you know uh, not as good uh engineered and all that stuff but at least this uh, 30th brigade is in pretty good shape it's pretty sort of fresh it didn't suffer much from the beginning of the war so uh they should be able to withstand kind of like keep the defense line here in our in our estimate let's put this way um but okay let's keep going south now we're gonna look at the situation here straight west of Donetsk uh Russian side was is not able to continue exploiting initial sort of successes here in this salient and then they continued attacks on Avdivka uh then uh, Marinka again and then Novomikhailovka so this is like all your typical uh areas of attacks and then we uh, mentioned this about two or three days ago there is like large Russian unit mechanized unit floating around somewhere in this area so we're saying it's either going to be used here to continue exploit this or take New York because apparently for some reason it's it attracts Russian attention. So they either will try to use it here or maybe because as we discussed the situation uh, in the around the Papasna where they need more troops to continue exploiting and that looks like a more how to say. Uh, more interesting opportunity there for them so they may actually bring that unit from here to there but we'll, we'll find out as we kind of see that happening so this is just a closer look at the whole the same this situation northwest of Donetsk this is the salient um, let's keep going so now let's look at the stretch of the Zaporizhia uh, front line we're going to look at the eastern section we we'll focus mostly on the eastern section um, because that's the most critical, most important one. Um, because Russian troops tried to create the pincer here, but now situation is totally stable here. There is no really changes. Uh, positional fighting, artillery. In speaking of artillery, they we actually uh, this uh, this uh, self-propelled howitzers uh, from France, uh, Caesars, I think they called. So they were spotted here. They are part of the 55th Artillery Brigade, Ukrainian. So they are fighting somewhere in this uh, on the eastern stretch of the Zaporizhia front line. And as in general, our observation about the new artillery equipment that it goes into artillery brigades. So the same was with M777. Uh, I think it was uh, we forgot, but it was like a two with like 40th. Um, artillery brigade so we've seen those there and then 55th has this um that's obviously uh, 12 is uh, really not not a game changer in this war but it definitely helps right anything helps at this point so uh, let's actually just generally summarize situation here so uh, it's stable ukrainian defenses are, are centered around key strongholds kaminsky arihi hulai pole Velika Novosilka and then Vogladar is kind of like a like a corner position between the two front lines. This is the wedge that Ukraine uh, that the Russian side managed to uh, to build in Ukrainian defenses, but now it's stable. There, just for everybody to understand, there is no contiguous front line here because there is not enough troops. So it's all centered around the villages or larger towns, right? Like, well, not the the Skulaypol is a town. It's not like really large. It's probably like. I mean, between 15 to 20,000 people, Arihi is the same and even smaller, probably more closer to 15,000 people. So this is all kind of centered around some kind of um, sort of structures or, or urban um, uh, or urban structures are not truly big, but better than nothing. And as we discussed, there is the, the terrain here is very flat and um, sort of very open. So you can see long distances like 20, 30 kilometers. You can easily see. The only thing here is that there are like single um, single line trees to separate like fields from one from each other, but they like, you know, two, three kilometers or four kilometers one from another. And it's just a single line of trees. They don't really create kind of 
any protection or anything. They being planted there. They all artificially planted for to prevent um, soil erosion. So that was the idea there. Uh, and so, but it, as, overall, this is like a, we call it a flat at the ta as a table uh, terrain in general. And there's basically all agricultural sort of fields and everything. The only like kind of like um, the only things are um, the valleys of the rivers. Obviously, they kind of create like kind of like a, a ridges there, natural. But beyond that, it's all more or less kind of flat here. So let's actually finally, final, uh, final. Uh, we will finish with looking at the Kherson bridgehead. Situation here is kind of the same. What's going on is the Russian troops are digging in, creating, creating um, uh, lines of trenches, you know, strongholds, good defensive position basically. What this means is that then later when Ukrainian army will decide, or if it will decide, if it have enough forces to do so to actually dislodge Russian troops, it will be much, much harder to do because they will dig in and that will require much more firepower, more troops, more everything to actually be successful. So the time is uh, in this in this way on the Russian side because it allows them to build better defenses. You know, Ukrainian troops are doing the same thing, but at this point, you know, uh, giving that uh, expectation is that Ukraine will sort of eventually attack here and maybe that's an unjustified uh, uh, expectation we'll see but both sides here are on the def uh, on the defensive both strategically uh, uh, it's on the defensive and this probably will stay quiet until the situation uh, on Donbass salient or Sever salient will get resolved so that's obviously the, the the focus of the both sides right now so this is kind of like a you know, uh, secondary kind of um, front line at this point. Okay, everyone, thanks again for watching and until tomorrow, bye-bye.